three and a half years of ministry as portrayed by those this evening culminates in one evening that we know as the Last Supper. Can you imagine how they felt that night? as we just sort of had them portray to us. Can you imagine all the emotions of three and a half years of wondering and committing and believing and deciding and following? And all of that comes down to one night where he shares with them that tomorrow I'm going to go to the cross and I'm going to be crucified. And three and a half years of ministry moves from the Last Supper uh, to now what we know is the crucifixion, which all of that culminates in seven sayings of Christ on the cross. You've heard most of them. I want to walk you through those, and, and I'll be honest, I've probably read over a thousand pages and studied this so intensely that I don't know if I have enough time tonight to share because the volume that is, that is placed in this script that is played out before us, when you string these seven last sayings together, it's, it's a phenomenal story. When you get to hear them all at once, and, and maybe not just a sermon here or a, a, a drama there or a motion picture here and there, but when you actually get to hear all of what Jesus' final words were on the cross, the story that it portrays, and the story of our life, there's so much behind it, and there's so much that's in it, that tonight I want to just walk you through this, and I want to walk you through the seven last sayings, and there's no particular scripture because they're found all through the four gospels, and so they'll be on the screen for you to follow, but three and a half ministry, three and a half years of ministry bring us to this, this one moment of Seven last sayings. Number one, Father. Father. Say that word over and over and over in your mind. That The very first word that he begins his prayer with is Father. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Isn't it amazing that Jesus' ministry, the very first thing that he did was he opened up with a word of prayer. And now on the cross we see him now opening up his, his last and final words with prayer. And of course, what he prays for is for our sins to be forgiven. Why? Why? Because ever before him, the plans that he was making, always in front of him, our sin was always within the sight of God. It never left his mind. It never left his heart. He knew that the reason why he was born to only die so that you and I might live. Why? Why did he pray this prayer? Because of the blindness of the human heart. The the absolute darkness of our heart. Because here's what you and I don't know. Maybe we do know. Sometimes we forget that the enormity of our crimes is ever before us. I mean, what drove him to the cross was our sin. And as tragic as that is, what's even worse is that's still being committed today. That as I said last Sunday, if you were here, you didn't have to be there to put him on the cross. Our sins, your sins, my sins... The sins of all the past, the the sins of present, the sins of future. That's what put him on the cross. But thank God that we heard these words. Let me say them one more time. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Thank God we hear those words because forgiveness is now attainable because of this spoken request by Jesus Christ. Have you ever thought about that? The, The one thing that you and I can't do, I can't forgive you of your sins. You can't forgive yourself. I can't work my way into some sort of favor Of all the things that I needed to hear first, the very first thing that I needed to hear out of the mouth of of Jesus Christ was, I am here to offer forgiveness for your sins. And he realizes that he needs to call out to his heavenly Father. Father, I want to draw your attention to that one more time. He begins with a very personal relationship. You know, sometimes we make things like like church. Sometimes we make things even like prayer. We, We make them so formal, do we not? We often think that it's about a process and And once again, if you've been here long enough, you've heard me say over and over, there are more times mentioned in Scripture where God is pursuing you than you are pursuing God. And everything that we know about about salvation in Christ is absolutely a relationship. It's not a ritual. It's not a form. It's not an establishment. It's not something, some requirements that you must meet. It's a relationship. And the very first words out of Jesus' mouth was a word of relationship. A word of relationship, of restoration and redemption towards that relationship. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Number two, he cries out, Truly I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. This to me is one of the most amazing scenes in all of Scripture. 
Now think about that for just a moment. First of all, we know the crucifixion. We've seen movies like The Passion. We've heard it recounted. We're familiar with images and the account of what happened. And maybe you know a little bit of something of history that the word crucifixion never existed until the Roman Empire. It was a word that came out of this special torturous treatment that was devised for criminals. Listen, that was devised for criminals. But it was no accident that, that Jesus was crucified between two thieves. Stop for just a moment. It was no accident. Truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Because it's criminals that are in need of forgiveness. Now, for just a moment, will you, will you play along with me for just a moment? Have you seen the images, drawings? Uh, have you seen portraits of, of three crosses and Christ in the middle and the two thieves? Have you seen, would you put that image in your mind for just a moment? Seriously, would you just put that image in your mind right now? You've seen that. I have it hanging in my office. It's right behind my, my desk and and I know you've seen it countless and thousands of times. You're familiar with that, that image. But listen, here's what you and I need to understand. None of us come to Christ any other way than they did. None of us come to Christ other than the form of a criminal. You see, most people, to be honest, think they're too good to be damned. They think, well, I, 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 I'm not as bad as that guy. Well, I still can do something else. And, well, God, certainly you're a loving God. You wouldn't do such a bad thing to a good person, right? If, if we were to be honest, there are so many people out there that, that feel as though their, their, their life is too good to be damned. But here's the truth. None of us, we don't come to Christ in any other form other than a criminal. It wasn't just for scenery. It wasn't just because he was one of them if you will, it was because it's an absolute picture of you and I. Now, here's another picture I want you to put in your mind. The same picture. The same picture of Christ in the middle and one thief on the other side and one thief on the other side. Do you know that still happens to this day? Where both, have you ever thought, both men heard the same message, but one chose to say, Father, forgive me. Be with me. Bless me. Receive me. And one chose to walk away. No matter how powerful the drama, no matter how, no matter how awesome the worship, no matter how the message might come across to you this morning, do you know that same picture still plays itself, plays itself out and it's playing itself out right now in your human heart? You get to decide with Christ in the middle, which one are you going to be? Are you going to be the one that says, forgive me, I believe in you, I trust in you, save me, forgive me of my sins? Or are you going to be the one that just simply mocks? You say, well, I would never mock God. Well, then not believing and not trusting and not receiving, the Bible says you do. You see, here's what we know. Truly, I say to you, now listen, today, today you will be with me in, in paradise. Now think about this for a moment, another side of that, that cross. Do, do you have the image of those three men? Now, do you have the image of that one criminal hanging on the cross that asked for forgiveness? Would you pause for just a moment and just focus on that one criminal? Because you and I, we know we, we have no other way of coming to Christ but just like that man. But here's something you may not know about that man that separates a lot of us from him. It's not that he asked God to save him, but for, for many folks, what brings them to that moment of decision and what, what might choose them to be the other criminal is this right here. Have you ever thought about this for a moment? That man had no moral life coming to that moment of Christ. He didn't come to God and he didn't say, listen, I don't know why I'm here. I really was a good person. There's my mom. She can tell you I was a good guy. I think I'm a good guy. I got called up in this thing. Listen, this man had no chance to have a moral life hanging on that cross. So many people before being presented to come to Christ, well, I need to get some things right. Well, I need to go home and make sure... This man didn't have the opportunity to come off of that cross and say, Look, God, let me go get some things right before I, I make a confession to you. This man had no moral life. Not only that, but he never had an opportunity of good works after that. And if you and I aren't careful, that's the way we come to Christ. Or maybe that's the way we walk away from him. We, like that criminal, we may not recognize we're a criminal, but we, we certainly would try to choose to, to bring up the morality of our life. Or, or maybe in, even after coming to a decision in Christ, we may say, well, can I do some good things to, to prove that I'm a Christian? This man had neither option. And yet, what did Jesus say to him today? He didn't say, well, wait till tomorrow, do a few good things. 
He didn't say, well, separate yourself just a moment if you'll confess this and that. If you'll, you know, let, let, me, let, me, let me hear testimony from your mother. He had no moral life coming bef- to, to that moment. And he absolutely had no opportunity of a life of good works after that. All he had was his spoken faith in that moment. Which is why the Bible says, if you will believe in your heart, confess with your mouth that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You don't have to be here tonight and say, well, I need to go home and get some things right. You certainly don't need to be here tonight and say, well, well, maybe if I can prove myself after that. No. You and I are just like that criminal on the cross. We don't come to Christ any other way than a criminal. And you and I can't come to him and say, well, I might be hanging on the cross when I was a good guy yesterday. I might be hanging on the cross, but if you'll get me down, I can prove myself. Absolutely not. Today, Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. Such, such little is asked of this man. But so much is given. Isn't that salvation? So little is asked. Jesus wasn't asking hardly anything. But yet so much was given. The same message applies to today. All he's asking is if you will confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now here's here's an amazing turn in this. Statement number three is, is Jesus cries out in the middle of this, Woman, behold your son. Now stop and think about that for a moment. We start out with with a word of prayer. Well, We start out with an announcement and awareness that, that sin is on his mind. Sin has never left his sight. The reason why he was at the cross never left him. Your sin, my sin, all sins of past, present, and future, what drove him to the cross, what kept him focused on the cross was sin. And that's what allowed him to stay on the cross because he knew the work that needed to be accomplished, the love of God that had to come into his life to offer the sacrifice, the final payment for our sins, something that you and I could not do. But understand this, the very first statement is it's a statement of prayer. It's a, it's a statement of redemption and restoration. Even in that moment, so weak and as they so eloquently and beautifully portrayed up here with every last breath that he had, he still conjures up enough breath to say, to be a savior and to say, today you'll be with me in paradise. But here he is in this moment. Here, here we see the perfect blending of divinity and humanity. If you'll go back and you'll read through the Gospels, you'll find that most of the places Jesus did ministry were the hidden places and the secret places and the quiet places of sorrow. You and I recall the, the big places, the feeding of the 5,000. We hear of the walking on the water, but it was Jerry's daughter. It was in that house. Most of those places, Jesus found people in secret areas of sorrow and in quiet places of hurt and pain. You see, here's what we know about Jesus. We see him being so human and yet at the same time so divine. When the book of John says, and the word became flesh... I mean, this is his moment where he's recognizing, I, I, I was created by God. I, I put on flesh and bone. The invisible became visible. God became man. What, is that, what does this mean to us? Listen, it means he is a close, caring, compassionate father. So often when we think of God, we see an image of father time. As some... some Long beard fellow clothed in white with maybe a crystal clear or white staff on a white throne in a white room. And we think he's sort of like father time and has nothing to do with us. And all he does is bark out orders. But right now Jesus is showing us. He's demonstrating to us the number one quality characteristic of God that cannot be changed by two immutable things, 2 Corinthians, that God is real and that God cannot lie. What we see right here is God is demonstrating that God is a close, caring, compassionate God. Which is why Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 says that the government shall be upon his shoulder and he shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Have you ever felt like you needed counsel? I mean, honestly, have you ever just cried out to God, God, just show me, just speak to me, just help me. Wonderful Counselor, Everlasting Father, Mighty God. Prince of Peace. He's not just some father time figure who only wants to bark out orders in hopes that things go well in the cosmos. No, he is a close, caring, compassionate father. I think what Jesus was saying in this moment is, is 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6, casting all your anxieties on him. 
he cares for you. Because he looked at his mother and he, he knew he could see the anxiety on her face. Jesus knows the anxiety you're struggling with. He understands the pain that you're going through. He demonstrates in this moment that he's 100% God, but absolutely 100% divine. The Bible says, cast, take, throw all of your cares upon him. The fourth statement we see is he says, my God, my God. Listen, why have you forsaken me? If you'll ever do a study of the word forsaken, forsaken is, is one of the most tragic words in the human language. Of what it means, the connotation that it carries, the impact that it has when someone feels rejected, when someone feels forsaken, when we feel abandoned. When at that moment Jesus cries out, My God, my God, why have you turned your back on me? Why have you rejected me? Why have you forsaken me? At that moment, we see the, the manifestation of divine love, but yes, we also see God's inflexible justice. God is a God of love, but God demands a price be paid for sin. And Jesus became all of sin that you and I have ever committed. He became that. And at that moment, listen, at that moment, this, this wasn't sort of a cry of desperation. You have to understand what this was. At that moment, the, the whole human heart was on display. When Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God had to turn his back on sin. That meant that Jesus became the payment that was required for you and I. But what that meant was at that moment, the, the whole heart was on display. It showed our, our tragic hatred toward God. You say, well, I don't hate God. The Bible tells us that men would rather love the darkness than the light. The Bible tells us, and you know you've made those decisions. I've made those decisions to sin rather than do what's right. I've made those decisions to disobey rather than obey. At that moment, the entire human heart was on display. Our love for darkness and our enmity, our, our separation from God. And Jesus cried out in just a moment. He felt what you and I would ultimately one day feel, separated from God. He had to put himself in that position so that you and I would never have to go through that. Understand this. At the cross, something happened. At the cross, man did a work. He displayed his sinfulness. At the cross, Satan did a work. He displayed his hatred toward God. At the cross, Jesus did a work. He died, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. At the cross, God did a work. He displayed his holiness and satisfied justice by pouring out his wrath on his son, the one who was made sin for us. My God, my God. Listen, hang on. My God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? This was a question that no one around the cross could answer. Only when Jesus answered that question could that question have ever been answered. The Bible tells us that one day every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. One, it doesn't matter who you are. One day every one of us are going to meet Christ. And I can tell you this. It's better to meet him then when you've made the decision now than to meet him then and wish you would have made the decision now. Because the Bible says you and I will feel what Christ felt on the cross, that separation. No one could answer that question. God had to send his son, Jesus Christ, to be able to answer that question. And thank God he answered it. Amen? Or that question would still be left open-ended today. Listen, it was a cry of desperation. Thank God we do not need to echo it. It was a cry of separation. May we never experience it. It was a cry of atonement. I pray you receive it. Number five, listen to this, I thirst. He literally cries out, I thirst. What does this show? It shows a number, number one, it shows submission. He had become a, a willing part of, in this sacrifice. Submitting to all the cruelty that had to be offered. It shows sympathy. In other words, we have a high priest that can identify with all of our sufferings. I know you've thirsted, and not just physical thirst, but you've thirsted for answers. You, you, you've thirsted for peace. You've begged God for moments of mercy. You've begged God for moments of quietness. In all of that, Jesus displays what he knows you and I will go through. It displays a universal need as well as a universal problem. The whole world is in thirst. 
The whole world is looking for something to satisfy its cravings. And when Jesus is crying this out, it's not that he's wanting water. He's displaying a cry of the human heart. The human heart is thirsting for something. Why do you think we have statements like, thank God it's Friday? Because our heart longs for something other than our job and something other than the moment. This request, by the way, is true of the millionaire as well as the beggar. It doesn't matter who you are and how well off you think you are. The request comes equally among all of us. Only Christ alone can quench that thirst. Number six, it is finished. It is finished. To us, it's three words. In the Greek, it's one word, to telestai. It's one word. Listen, this is not a helpless cry of desperation. Do you understand that? This is not a helpless cry of, of desperation. It, it was a cry of, of declaration. It wasn't like something's happened that's out of my control. He's basically saying, it's done. It's done. Redemption is now possible. John chapter 17, verse 4. Jesus said, I glorified you here on earth, having accomplished the work you gave me to do. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God showed his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Do you understand the gravity of this? Do you have that image in your mind again? Christ in the middle and the thief on one side, the thief on another? That's you and I. What he did was he finished it for you. He didn't just finish it for the thief for the thief that said, I accept. He even finished it for the thief that said, I didn't. It's for all of us. The Bible says, whosoever, who, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And number seven, how he started is how he ended. Did you notice that? Father. Once again, it shows relationship, not ritual. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Listen to the words. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. He didn't say, Father, into my hands the soldiers cost me my life. My life is given away. He, he gave his own life away. Having said all this, he breathed his last. Father. This is where every one of us are at the moment of the cross. Do you know him as God or do you know him as Father? Do you have a relationship with religion or do you have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? Father, he lived and died like no other. He laid down his own life. No one took it from him, the Bible tells us. But here's what I love the most. He trusted his life. Listen, he trusted his own life in the hands of the Father. Do you hear that? He trusted his life into the hands of the Father. What were the Father's hands? We know what they are. The Bible says the Father's hand is a place of eternal security. The Father's hands mean communion with God. The Father's hands means eternally secure. The Father's hands mean care of life and care of death. Listen to John chapter 10, verses 28 and 29. The Bible says this, I give them eternal life and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. On the day that Jesus came out of the tomb.